here. This is such a wonderful event, and I'm really honored, and I know our community is honored to have um, the Common Good um, come be part of what we're trying to build here. Not just in our congressional campaign, but in our state races and in our local races. Um, this is really about changing our voice, um, the voices that represent us in government. So thank you so much to all of the talented folks from Vote for Common Good, and to all of you for being here this evening. And I would thank you for giving up your evening, but there was no way I was going to find anything as good on TV <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as Genesis was. So um, it's really our pleasure and my pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to start tonight by telling you a, a story from my childhood um, and a little bit about how I came to be um, the person that I am. So I did not grow up in California. Um, I grew up in Iowa during the 1980s during the farm crisis. And um, when I was a small child, the price of grain was going up, the price of land was going up, um, and then pretty soon interest rates started to go up. Um, and there came the rub. Um, and grain prices started to fall, and land prices started to fall, um, and it was getting harder and harder to make ends meet. And one Friday afternoon, I was probably in about sixth grade, um, I rode the bus by an hour and a half each way to school. And the uh, small town, four way, uh, little town in Square. And we didn't have any traffic lights, um, not even one. We didn't even have stop signs. Um, we had rules of traffic. Um, you yielded to the pickup truck bigger than the one you were driving. <laughs> um, and the bus came to a stop. It was an honest to God traffic jam in my tiny town. And Nobody on the bus had ever encountered this before, and we, we start to get rowdy, and we're yelling, let's go, let's go, why are we stopped? And the bus driver says in that kind of worried voice that you only get when you're about 30 and up, um, she says, the bank's closed. And somebody at the back of the bus, some wise ass who may or may not have been me, <laughs>
And I so took Elizabeth Warren's bankruptcy class, um, and I went off and started studying why families get into financial trouble. Illness, loss of a job, often loss of a spouse, to death or divorce or family breakup. And I remember standing in a hotel ballroom, and um, I was on stage, and it was a huge, one of those really boring, huge, low ceiling, kind of oppressive light. And I was on stage, and there was a whole room full of lawyers, so you, you know it was a party. And I, I believe I was the 8 o'clock speaker, um, and this was something called Continuing Legal Education, which at 8 o'clock is also known as reading the paper. And, but I was passionate, and I had, I had done this study showing what banks did when they went into our court system. And I had shown that over and over and over again, they went into the court, they broke the law, and they got away with it. And I had charts, and I had graphs, and I was presenting my findings. And I got all done, I was incredibly passionate about it. And a gentleman, I said, any questions? And the, the room was just like this. <laughs> Quiet. And then a gentleman way at the back, and he was wearing a suit that probably cost more than my parents' mortgage. And he stood up and he said, Young lady, Wells Fargo does not make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> now this was back in 2007 and 2008. And that's what we were told to believe. That was what Wells Fargo was telling the government, and the government was believing it. But I had studied what happened to real families. I had gone into bankruptcy court and listened to their stories. And I had counted and looked and studied and I saw what was really going on. Was Wells Fargo wasn't just making mistakes, Wells Fargo was engaged in active misbehavior, trying to cheat people out of their homes. So I kept talking about that research. That research wound up on the front page of the New York Times. But it still was taking years and years for families to get help. And I thought about what happened in my childhood, how that bank got reopened over the weekend. But farmers waited years and years and years and watched their economy fall apart. And we saw the same thing with the Wall Street bailout. Remember going to bed, and the next morning, our federal government had bailed out Wall Street. I don't have any problem with that. But what about Main Street? What about the rest of us? So when Attorney General, or then Attorney General Kamala Harris asked me to be your foreclosure monitor, your foreclosure prevention um, person, I said yes. And I'm sure I, when Kamala reached out to me, it was like many phone calls she made. Um, I had my two-month-old baby on the floor, because that's where you like to keep them. Um, of my office, and I had just gone to work for a few minutes with my young baby. Anybody ever done that as a working mom? And the phone rang, and then of course the first rule is don't take your young baby to work. The second rule is if you take your young baby to work, don't answer the phone at 5.30 when your other kids have to be picked up at 6 from daycare. And there it was, it was Kamala Harris, and she asked me, she just signed this big settlement of things. And she said, I don't care about what these banks have promised on paper. I only care what they're going to do to people. And I want you to be on the ground every day, listening to people and trying to help them. And holding those banks' feet to the fire, because they make promises to the people of California. So we worked right here in Orange County and all across the state. And right here in Orange County, we helped 11,000 families stay in their homes, stay in their communities. conversations. And each time I had one, I was reminded of that childhood story. That Washington works for those who buy influence and not everyday people like us. For me, this campaign against Republican Mimi Walters, it's about doing the work I've been doing. It's about fighting for families. 
It's about standing up for our economy that should give everybody an opportunity. An economy where everybody, no matter how big you are, you have to follow the rules. It's about fighting for clean air and clean water and not letting big polluters poison this beautiful world that God gave us. It's about making sure that we honor each other by providing health care, affordable health care, to everybody. For me, the vision of the common good is about those things. It's about doing right by each other. It's about recognizing that we are bound together by the education that we provide for our kids, by the retirement benefits that we provide for seniors, by our investments in infrastructure to keep us safe and get us to our jobs. I'm running for Congress to be your representative, and I would be so honored to have your support on November.